We hope everybody's been having a great day. We're on to our next part of Fire Alarm Systems with a unique partnership between the IAFC Fire and Life Safety Section and NEMA. Uh, my name is Michael O'Brien. I'm the International Director with the Fire and Life Safety Section and serving on the IFC Board of Directors. And today we've got a great presentation for you. Uh, Roger with JCI, also representing uh, NEMA, which we have had a long-standing and just fantastic relationship with some industry pros that are aimed at trying to make our built environment just safer every day, is going to spend some time talking to us today about emerging communication systems. Roger, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, and I'm glad to be here today. Thank you for having me. And on behalf of NEMA, thank you for uh, the interactions we've had and the partnerships we've enjoyed for a long time and uh, more to come. So for today, we were going to uh, discuss um, fire alarm systems and emergency communication systems, or some might say MNS. We'll discuss that a little bit more as we go. But um, emergency communication systems as a whole encompasses a whole lot more than just mass notification uh, when we get into our life safety world. So uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, integrated systems, one- and two-way emergency communication systems, um, some real-time emergency communications, uh, intelligibility uh, considerations. We always talk about is it loud enough, but we also need to understand is it um, being able to be understood by the audience. And then some of the technologies and best practices, and then finish up if there's any uh, questions and answer time, uh, if time allows. So we'll just jump right into it. What we're seeing in the industry for many years now is kind of a convergence of systems. People are having, uh, companies are having less people to do work uh, I need more work to be done by, by, by less people. I only have one engineer or one life safety director or one uh, person in security office, and I need all of these systems to somehow converge together so that person can use that one interface. But also, as my buildings are becoming more complex, I need these systems to be inter interactive or inter interoperability between the two. So my fire alarm is going to activate HVAC to turn on fans, turn off fans, pressurize stairwells, exhaust uh, smoke and smoke control systems. I might need to unlock doors uh, or maybe in some areas lock doors, depending upon where I am. Uh, elevators are now playing a huge part. Uh, we now have in the building codes the allowance for elevators to be used to evacuate occupants during an emergency. So there is now a, a set of requirements that if you're going to do that uh, in A17 for the elevator code, in the life safety code, whether it's NFPA 101 or the International Building Code, and then within 72, NFPA 72 on what kind of messages do I need to have and what kind of interaction do I need to have for those elevators to be utilized. So that's a very, very complex uh, integration. But um, just kind of as a side note on that one, for elevators today, we're now telling people in certain buildings with certain applications not to use the stairwell, but if it's available, to use the elevator to evacuate. So that might be a whole other seminar in its own uh, for us to explore uh, as a group. Uh, voice notification systems, how we're getting information out to people, uh, and along with paging systems. Uh, whether it's textual board, reader boards, uh, speaker arrays outside of buildings, inside of buildings. And then everybody today has a mobile communicating device uh, and to be able to send information to that um, to let people know what's going on as well. And then the displays for the, uh, the, the first responders to be able to utilize to, get, to gain information as to what's going on in facilities as they arrive on scene. When we talk about, you know, integrating, integration of these systems, you know, it's kind of all the ones you see here, the, the heating, ventilation, air conditioning, building automation, energy, uh, environmental, which is becoming more and more complex for us, right, and particularly for first responders as you're looking at putting these photovoltaic cells on the roofs of buildings and uh, how do I turn the power off to those? How do they integrate into the life safety system? Can the life safety system shut them down automatically for me? Um, you know, and, and other things that, that come into play, as well as security. Security is a big, big uh, concern today with, with life safety. Um, I don't want to let the bad people in during an event, but I want to make sure people are able to get out when they need to in the event of a fire or other life-threatening uh, life event. Um, so it's a, a big concern, and is an, another uh, document that's being created or has been created, NFPA 3000, for um, active shooter hostile event uh, response uh, 
system uh, is, is another document that we are utilizing or trying to codify on how to do uh, proper security and fire integration together. And I, as, as we say in the at least in the fire alarm world, just because you can do something doesn't mean you should do something. You know, we're starting to see people putting chocks on doors and school rooms uh, and things like that to try to keep the bad people out, but it also prohibits the first responders from doing their job. So uh, with NFPA 101, the International Building Code, and NFPA 3000, those are the things that are being wrestled with right now on, um, on how to do that. So as I kind of digress a little bit and go back to our emergency communication system, you know, when we set, uh, I say we, I've done a lot of work with NFPA 72, uh, as well as a lot of my colleagues. Um, when we came together back in 2008 or so time frame, we started to discuss creating a chapter within NFPA 72 that would be for mass notification systems. But when we did that, we said, well, what about firefighter telephones? What about um, paging systems? What about areas of refuge? And we started writing all these pointers and having these big post-it notes going around the room. And we quickly found out that we can't just keep writing pointers to all of these. We need to kind of do a power grab on this new chapter that's being developed. And anything that has to do with uh, communications, audible communications, really needs to reside in one chapter. So out of protected premises, uh, we brought in uh, in-building fire evacuation voice communication systems and pulled that into the ch into the chapter. And then mass notification became a part of this and distributed recipient, uh, public address if you're going to use that in for mass notification, area of refuge. And as you see here, all of these voice systems then were in one chapter. We said, you know, we can't call this the mass notification systems chapter because that's just a component of what we're doing. We're really doing everything that has to do with emergency communication systems, whether it's area of refuge, um, firefighter telephones, uh, voice evacuation for fire alarm systems. All of those are now in one chapter. So this is actually out of the annex for Chapter 24 uh, for ECS, or emergency communication systems. And I kind of use this once in a while because it helps me to understand, well, one-way communication systems, where is that within the code? Um, in the chapter, and then two-way, how is that laid out in the chapter, and then info command and performance-based design. So this kind of really helps me to understand when I'm putting together a system um, where the various sections are within Chapter 24 uh, for the various systems. So we talk about real-time emergency communications, and when we look at the, um, the definition from mass notification, and we get that from the Department of Defense, and mass notification is defined as real-time information and instructions to people in an area or location. And that's the key. It's not just telling people, hey, there's something going on, whoop, whoop, there's something going on, and that's it. Giving them the information of there's a weather event, there's a hurricane coming, it will be here in two hours, everyone needs to re re um, relocate to the bathrooms, the lobbies, or wherever the areas of refuge are, and, um, and also the most important part of all of that was who's providing that information. People are much more apt to do what you want them to do when you say who it is. This is Captain uh, Riswig from the local fire department, or I'm the, the uh, life safety director of the facility, or something like that. So it's very important for people to understand what to do, when to do, what's going on, and who's giving those instructions. And people are more apt to do that. And contrary to popular belief and all the movies that we see out of Hollywood, when people are told all of this information, they're much less likely to panic. And again, and do what you tell them that you want them to do. So when we talk about uh, this real-time communications and disseminating information, we start to look at various ways to get that done. So there's not one way that we should be doing this, not just saying, well, we have speakers throughout the facility. We're just going to use the speakers. Well, there needs to be other ways to do that. So in NFPA uh, 72 language, we call that the layered approach, and the layers build upon one another. So for inside of a building, we have different layers. We have fire alarm, voice evac, the codified stuff that we put in that we all know and love. Uh, we can send information out to uh, computers where pop-up displays will appear to 
to let you to give you information as to what's going on. Uh, maybe signage throughout a facility to give you uh, more particular information on if you're on this floor, relocate to the east wing or the west wing, or go up two floors, down two floors, or what have you. And as a side note for the signage, we're finding these message signs to be utilized in life safety more and more, and we're using them for things that are not life safety, like, for example, in an office building, what's on the lunch menu today? What's the stock market doing? Although you might not want to look at that right now, um, or other things. And then it gets the people used to looking at this sign for information, what's the weather report for today? So when an event happens in the building, a life safety event, they know instinctively to go right to that sign, and it's going to give me more information. And then we have what we call reverse 911, where we can call out to people and let them know um, what's going on. You know, in, in the southern states, we have, you know, I'm in Florida, we have hurricanes, and if there's a, a hurricane that's coming, the school will call the parents and let them know, don't send your, your kid to school today. Up north, when it snows, we do the reverse. Uh, we call pe people and tell them, hey, it's a snow day, schools are closed, don't drop off your, your children. So uh, we can do that with the life safety systems as well. And then when we go outside the building, we put in what we call HPSA, high-powered speaker arrays. And these are typically those big speakers. They go on poles, or they could also be portable. And they're able to, to send out pretty clear announcements with uh, several hundred feet, sometimes within a couple of miles away from a building to let the community know what's going on. And that's important because if I am in a college environment, for example, and I have a project going on in the chemistry building, and we somehow the wrong chemicals got exposed, and we created some type of a uh, chemical cloud that could be hovering over the school, and it's going to migrate out over top of the fence and into the community. Well, how do I let the community know that there's a possible you know, chlorine leak or a gas leak or something's going on in the school? I can use these high-powered speaker arrays to let people know. And then we'll have call stations to let people, you know, go to a muster area, let people know, you know, that they're safe. Uh, outside sirens come into play. And then we call it the at-your-side uh, alerting, where we're going to send information to your mobile device to let you know what's going on, uh, short message service, text messaging, uh, to, you know, to send out those uh, short characters to let you know, again, what's going on. Uh, radios, pagers, laptops, PCs, and the like. So all of this information kind of comes together to help to, uh, to alert people as to what's going on. And then primarily what we're talking about is voice communication. So voice communication in the fire alarm world, for those of you that have been around for a while, we've always talked about we need the sound to be so many dB or decibels above the ambient background noise. And we've always cared about the audibility. Can it be heard? You know, can you hear the bells? Can you hear the whoop, whoop of the fire alarm? But in recent years, and I'm saying recent, relatively recent, 15 years or so, we've really started to look heavily at intelligibility. Can I not only hear what is being said, but can I understand what is being said? So now in our fire alarm world, our emergency communication world, we are now putting in systems that we are um, able to determine whether or not they're intelligible. Can you hear what's being said, and can you understand what's being said? So in Fire Alarm, we have uh, tools in the sound world. We have tools that we're able to inject a sound into a test sound into a microphone and then have some type of a test module that we go out to the speakers and we listen for that test tone or that test message. And the meter, how it works is it's able to take and listen to what's being broadcast out of the speakers. It knows what the test signal is, so it can compare the two. And then it gives us a deviation report. And this is where you hear about the term uh, STI, uh, the Speech Transmission Index. Um, and that's how we're able to come up with a value uh, to, whether, to know whether or not a system is intelligible. The two things that we cannot control for intelligibility is the person giving the messages and the person listening to those messages. Everything else from the microphone to the preamplifier, the amplifier, the speaker circuits, out to the speaker, we can control 100% in the code world and the manufacturing world. 
But if somebody speaks in a certain dialect or maybe doesn't speak loud enough or concise, and then the person that's listening maybe didn't have their hearing aids in today, maybe has a little bit of a, is deaf or hard of hearing, uh, we can't control those. But everything that we can control now, we, we call what we call codify. So when I take my product to UL Underwriters Laboratory to get it listed, they will verify my intelligibility reproduction of my microphone, my amplifier, my preamplifier, my speakers, and put a system together. So um, this is probably one of the things that I see not uh, is paid attention to as much as we have done with other things. We're very, as an industry, right? And this comes from fire marshals, fire inspectors, manufacturers, installer maintainers. So when I say we, I mean the, the collective we. We care, or we really seem to look a lot about, are the strobes in the right place? Are they the right candela? Am I getting the right audibility or decibels out of the devices? Are the pool stations at the right height, mounting height? You know, and we look at all of that stuff very, very particularly. But when it comes to intelligibility, it doesn't seem like there's that much of an emphasis put on that. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of dwelling on this a little bit because this, I think this is the one key when we talk about communication systems that we really need to address as an industry. And I put all of us in this bucket when I say industry. Um, it's great that I can hear what's being said, but can I understand it? You know, and we've all been in the airport where you're walking down the gate or towards the gate and you're hearing a garbled sound, and you're like, did they tell me to go to the gate or the gate's being relocated? Did they say gate 23 or 33? I'm not sure what they said. That's intelligibility you, when you can't understand that. And also with intelligibility, to clear help with that, in the code we require you or we uh, specify in certain applications that the message needs to be repeated. Because if people hear a message and they didn't get a word or a certain part of the message, they're kind of in tune to listen to it again and listen to particularly that section that they missed. So when, uh, if you're a first responder and you're going to use the microphone and have a live announcement, I think it's important to say what to do, when to do, what's going on, and who you are that's giving this information, but also give it again, maybe two times or even three times, to make sure people have heard what you said um, you know, as we're doing this. So it's kind of vital, as we have here, for, for safety information to get disseminated out. And intelligibility, I believe, absolutely is the key for this. So some of the considerations that we uh, care about have to be always back at the, des the design part of the system. Um, in code, there has been some questions about, do all areas of a building need to have intelligibility? Or does it make sense to spend the money that you need to make an area intelligible? So intelligibility has, comes down to the speakers that I use, the wiring that I use, the um, amplifiers that I use. And as a manufacturer and a designer, I'll tell you that there is no space that I cannot make intelligible. With enough money, I can make any area in a facility intelligible. But that's the key. What's the trade-off? Does it really make sense to make the entrance lobby of a hotel that's all marble, does it really make, need to make that intelligible if it takes a, an, an exorbitant amount of money to do that? Well, the answer is kind of no. If you're in the lobby, the first responders are there. You should be evacuating anyway. You're not going to be standing in the lobby listening to instructions or what to do. So in code, we said, well, if we're going to do this and we're going to allow areas not to be intelligible or not to have to have intelligibility, how do we identify that? So a term was coined, and we called it ADS, Acoustically Distinguishable Spaces. So what that means is I need to declare, and this is true now if anybody's doing plans review or design, any facility that I'm doing today that has voice fire alarm in it, I need to identify all of the building as to whether or not it is an acoustically distinguishable space and whether or not it needs intelligibility. So some facilities might say, the whole entire building is an ADS, and the whole entire building needs intelligibility. As opposed to my lobby in my hotel is going to be ADS-1, my ballrooms are going to be ADS-2, and all the ADS-2s need intelligibility. 
ADS-1s don't need intelligibility. So now it's incumbent upon the designer to have to do that because it's not up to me as the manufacturer or the installer maintainer to figure this out. It's up to the engineer of record who knows the intent of the life safety system and what needs to be done. So you probably have started to see this on some documents and maybe heard people talk about ADSs, but that's what we're referring to is what's distinguishable about this space for acoustics and then do I or do I not have to make that area intelligible? And the construction of the room plays a big part. If I have a room, again, that's all marble, like my lobby that I was just using, the sound bounces all over the place off of that, and it, it plays havoc with the reverberation and um, the echoing, and it's very, very hard to get an area um, intelligible from that. You know, when you go into a nice movie theater, they don't have hard walls um, on, on, in the theaters, they have usually carpeted, and in some cases they'll have multiple acoustical tiles, and the acoustical tiles grab the sound and pull it in. And they have speakers disseminated all down the side of the movie theater, so that whether you're in the front row or the back row, you're hearing pretty good about what's going on. And if there's any background noise that I might need to um, overcome, or do I need to turn it off? If I'm doing any type of background music or um, something of the like, or maybe there's a rock concert going on in a, in a hall, I need to be able to shut those systems down. And then we talk about paging zones and avoiding uh, overlapping of the signals, right? Because if I have speakers that are able to be heard from different zones in one area, that delay of the speaker uh, from the audio coming from me, it's kind of like when you're in a big um, stadium and the marching band comes out, and you see the person bang the drum, and then, you know, a half second, a second later, then you hear the bang up at the bleacher seats where you're sitting. That's the delay that you're hearing, because sound travels, you know, a lot slower than light does. So if I have speakers in different areas, and I'm maybe 100 feet away from one speaker, but very close to another, that's where I start to get the echo or the bounce back, and we start to talk about adding delays and other things in, in sound systems, so that what the delays do is um, allow you, and I'm getting a little bit probably care, uh, out here on this one, but delays allow the speaker that's far away from you to transmit the signal at a different time so that the listener is hearing the same signal at the same time out of the speaker that's close and the one that's far away. And then message synchronization is a big deal, too. If we're going to be sending out these messages, NFPA 72 now requires um, the signal to be synchronized, not just the um, visual signal. So visual signals for strobes for a long, long time had been in the code so that a person uh, doesn't go into some kind of a seizure if they see multiple flashes at the same time. Well, now we're looking at the same thing for audible devices, whether it's a tone and I'm doing temporal 4 or temporal 3 or I'm doing messages, those signals need to be synchronized so the listener can um, know what's happening and, and be able to understand that. And then we talk about microphone technique. You know, a microphone on a fire alarm system is a lot different than it is for a microphone that might be in your telephone or in a studio or, or something like that. You know, a lot of microphones manufacturers make, they're kind of noise-canceling microphones. They're, you know, unidirectional. They gotta, you've got to speak right into that microphone. And usually on some of the microphones, they have a little rubber grommet that pops out, maybe about a half of an inch or so. And that's made for you to put right against your lip or close to your mouth because that's how close you need to be to be able to communicate properly. Now, there's been many systems that I've gone out as a designer or a tech support person from my company, and they say the microphone just isn't loud enough. You've got to figure out what's going on. And I say, well, show me how you're using it. And the person's holding the microphone down close to their waist, and they're wondering why they can't be heard. It's not designed to work that way. That microphone needs to be right up against your mouth or very, very close um, to be able to pick up what's going on. So uh, the technology and the best practices, kind of wrapping it up here, so we have the fire alarm system, the user interface, and we talk about mass notification, you know, and sending all of these systems, these signals out to one another. And the interaction, if I have a mass notification event going on, a bad guy or a weather event, let's pull the cameras up automatically, do pre-position, pan, tilt, zoom, pull it up on the right camera, recording the right information, disseminating that out uh, to the people in the facility, uh, campus-wide or, or even outside of the campus. 
Um, all of this information needs to be sent. So when we talk about mass notification, I would probably the one thing I would leave you with is it needs to be intelligible, but it's not just speakers. It is so much more when we talk about mass notification systems. So um, with that, hopefully um, you got a little bit out of this with, with what's going on in the integrated world, one- and two-way communications, intelligibility, and, and best practices. And um, I'll go ahead and stop here, and, and if there's any questions, I'll be happy to answer them um, if we have time. Hey, Roger, this is uh, Mike. One of the things that, and, and I love that, how your presentation flowed and, and, and that talk about intelligibility. So when, when maybe a designer or an HJ is struggling with, right, there seems to be speakers, but they can't quite hear them, um, or maybe it just isn't um, clear, what is it that can be done to help solve that issue? Yeah, that's a great question, right? So I've been in the industry for a long time, and when I was a technician and a salesperson in the field, we would put in one or two speakers like in a ballroom. And if the AHJ came in or we decided it wasn't loud enough or I couldn't understand what was going on, what did we usually do? We got a ladder out, we climbed the ladder, we pulled the speaker down, and we changed the tap on the back from a half a watt to two watts. And we said, okay, it's louder, and can you hear it now? And we were pretty much happy with that, and we went on. With intelligibility, it's kind of the opposite. I don't want to have one speaker that it's a very high wattage uh, and send that out. What I want to do then is put in multiple speakers. You know, when you walk into a ballroom, for example, and you look up, you might see one or two fire alarm speakers. But look at the sound reinforcement system, the PA system. You look at those systems, and there might be 15, 20 speakers in that room. Why do they have so many speakers? Because they know that it's not booming out more wattage to make the announcement heard or presentation heard. It's more speakers at less wattage is why we do that. You know, it's the same way, you know, when you go into, like, a church, for example. You know, they, they have one speaker up at the front that might be pointing out to the congregation. Well, the people in the back of the congregation, typically, they don't fall asleep because of the the message that's being presented to them, typically people in the back of the congregation fall asleep because they get listener fatigue. I am trying so hard to hear what's being said, and I'm hearing the echoes. It's really difficult for me to, to listen to what's being said. In contrast, you go to a really nice movie theater, and you don't have just one speaker in the front of the, of the, by the screen. You have speakers all the way down the sides, and the, and the sound and all is right there. And unless the movie's really, really bad, Typically, you don't fall asleep in a movie theater because you don't have that listener fatigue. So to come back to your question is, the answer really is going to be put in more speakers, not increase the tap or the wattage to those speakers. No, that makes uh, perfect sense. Roger, I wanted to say thanks. Uh, talking with Chief King, we're so appreciative of your knowledge. You're truly an expert in this arena and we know this information is going to be spread out well within the fire service. So on behalf of all of us here at the section, the Fire and Life Safety section of the IFC, we want to say thank you. And we hope everybody has a great day. We'll see you on the next webinar, everybody.